All right. Well, let's pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of today. We thank you for the gift of this time and this space to gather in this place and to uh, talk about how we can encounter you in lots of different ways. And then today in particular, we, we are interested in, in exploring how we can encounter you in that which is good and joyful and pleasurable in our life. And we give you thanks for all those things that bring us new way. Lord, be with us in this time. Guide us. In your name we pray. Amen. So, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, talking today about drinking tea. But we're not really talking about tea, obviously. Um, we're talking about uh, the, the author shares a moment in her day where her house, which has children in it, is unusually quiet. And it's a beautiful, kind of serene, picturesque scene outside her window. It sounds like it's probably winter when she's capturing this moment. And she's got a warm cup of tea, and she's sitting in a chair. And it's a moment just of peace and pleasure and goodness for her to kind of reflect on all that is good in her life and take a moment of that. So that's kind of what this drinking tea is capturing. John already asked me this morning, he said, well, does it have to be tea? Can it be coffee? Because he's a coffee drinker. So what I'd like us to do real quickly, if you'd share your name and your favorite beverage. It could be anything. Okay, your favorite <laughs> beverage. And we'll start right here, and we'll just go around. Uh, and uh, it could be whatever you like. It could be wine. You could say whatever you like. You knew I was going to do it. You were looking at me like, is it okay to say wine? Yes, it's okay to say wine. That's okay. Without even saying it, you're... Favorite drinker, Kevin A. Tell me that. There you go. All right. <laughs> and I'm Charlie, and I guess it would be Diet Coke, although I've cut back. <laughs> Irene, definitely coffee. Joe, uh, Sangria. I can name it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, Coke. Miss, water. Uh, Martin, tea. Oh, uh, I love water. We can take the back row, sure. Betsy, I see. Coffee. I like uh, the, the, this uh, green version of Earl Grey, oh. which is very catchy. There's a lot of around. Okay. Uh, Sybil, iced tea. Bill, coffee. Yeah. Cafe uh, Corlechin. Mm -hmm. uh, hey. Uh, hey. Uh, a cherry and a liquid glass of Bordeaux. Rob, coffee. Rob, um, iced tea, morning, um, and uh, Sauvignon Blanc, night. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to say about tea when you were kind of saying tea, tea is an equivalent to coffee or anything else because, as he mentioned the Earl Grey, You've got so many different teas if you're a tea drinker, and they have distinct the taste. They do. Mm -hmm. they do. Yeah. Ginger coffee. Caroline tea. Scott coffee. Let's get our friends online if you're willing to share, if you just unmute yourself. And again, your name and your favorite beverage. I'm Barbara, and I love Earl Grey tea. I'm Janice, and I like hot chocolate. I'm Mary Beth, and I like iced tea. I'm Lee Barks, and although I don't have it very often or in large quantity, bourbon. <laughs> I'm Rich Gilbert, and I like wine. Very good. All right, I'm John, and I'm going to go with water. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so again, this, this idea of... Um, Enjoying what is good, the subtitle for this chapter is Sanctuary and Savoring. Um, two verses I wanted to kind of lift up uh, for us to kind of have in the back of our minds as we, as we reflect on this. A passage from Genesis, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. I mean, there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is just a call back to that narrative from Genesis where we hear over and over again each day God created something, and the response, the refrain from God was, it was good. So we know that God has created a good creation, and that what God has made is good. And we lift that up, and we recognize that. And then from the psalm, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. So we have this opportunity to kind of reflect and recognize that all that God has created, all that we are witness to, all that we are a part of, is designed to be good. 
So we've kind of moved through our day. We're here at drinking tea, and the part of what we're talking about is using our senses to enjoy God's goodness. And part of what she gets at is this idea of pleasure. And pleasure is our deep and human response to an encounter with beauty and goodness. So when we encounter God's, the goodness of what God has made, we lift the firm and lift up. Pleasure is our response, our deepest response to that encounter. And it's a time for us to kind of reflect on what's around us and say, to agree with God. Yes, all that is around me is God, is good. You're right, God. I agree. This is very good. Your creation is very good. And she has this, this line, when we enjoy God's creation, we in turn reflect God himself. So as always, every chapter has a little bit of part of worship that she's bringing in. And then this time she's kind of talking about the totality of worship. So when we think about worship, she suggests that our senses have an opportunity to come alive in worship. And so I want to just open a question to the group. And those who are online, feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat, and I will try to, to catch those comments as well. But when you think about worship, whether it's here or any other time in your life, um, in what ways have you enjoyed the goodness of God in worship using your five senses? So in our worship, where do you use your senses to encounter God's goodness? And we're going to go through each of the five. Um, I, I recognize that for some of us, we immediately think of worship, or I'll name it myself. I think of it as being more of a passive thing. I'm receiving something. We're not necessarily thinking of it all the time as a participatory thing, maybe. But as we think about worship, really think hard about it. Where do we encounter God's goodness using those five senses? So let's start with the first one, hearing. Where do we encounter God's goodness in hearing? That's probably a little more straightforward, right? Music. Music for a lot of us, right? Music, hearing the choir. Today there's a beautiful cello. Telephone conversations. Children. Yeah, so, so outside of worship, telephone conversations, and even in worship, conversation with those that we love and care about before the service begins or at the end of the service, right? Um, we hear God's word proclaimed, okay? All right, we speak uh, in a litany or in a prayer together. So that's hearing. I think that's a little bit easier one. What about seeing? Children. We see children come forward, engaged in children's message, or running around in the connection service, or playing at the table. Stained glass windows. Okay, stained glass windows, the beauty of the space. The flowers, right? There's always flowers that are there. The liturgical colors. Right, we talked about that earlier this summer, about how the, the colors change, right? What season we're in, what's going on? The pageantry. I mean, I think we do that less than some others, but I saw the Pope at Easter, and the pageantry there was astounding. Yeah. So we've got, I mean, when you think about the visual, and, and both worship spaces, there's the lighting is set a certain way, whether it's coming in through stained glass windows or dimmed in the connection service. There's emphasis on what's up front. Okay. Who means the people? Just sitting in the church sure. and looking at everybody there, the people sitting close to one another, reaching out, and you know, you can see the community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we see, I think hearing and seeing are, are pretty easy ones. What about smelling? Sense of smell. How do we encounter God's goodness in the sense of smell? In Eastern Orthodox churches where I, I go on vacation, you just smell the incense, and it really impacts me as a Protestant. It's like, just yeah. smell the priest, you know, with the incense. Sure. It's like, wow. So, yeah, so in some other traditions, yeah. incense being used is Cool, I, I, I like that. Yeah. What else? For us, it's uh, Chanel number five. <laughs> <laughs> There's some truth to that. We smell uh, people's perfume or cologne around us, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But what? we probably, as Protestants, least stimulate that. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, these are larger worship spaces here, but I will tell you that if you walk by the communion table, there are smells there. And maybe when the plate comes past to you, you smell bread, you smell the grape juice. Right. Sorry. Um, sometimes, I mean, you think about some special services, we might... Um, if we're doing a candlelight service, for example, we smell that smoke that goes past us. I think you're right, well, it's, it's, we're, we're looking for little things here. It's one of the least senses that we lift up. But there are moments in our worship where sense of smell is lifted up. When we're outside at the beach or outside, if you walk the border of the 
Yeah. Yeah. Or the, yeah, if it's an outside worship experience, absolutely. I would say that even like some of our, our, our times where there's floral arrangements, when we've got, you know, Easter lilies or, you know, things like that, we kind of, you kind of get a whiff of those. Right? The connection service has coffee. Yeah. <laughs> the connection service has coffee. Connection well, coffee. Has coffee. yeah, it has all that stuff in the back there. Yes. And I will tell you that um, we've had some funerals recently, and all the flower arrangements that are a part of those oftentimes end up in the <laughs> office. And this last week, there have been probably 10 floral arrangements that have been sitting in the front office. And as soon as you walk in that front door, you're hit with this wave of that scent. And that may be a little more dissipated in a larger space like the sanctuary. But those floral arrangements give off some smell, too. Uh, what about uh, tasting? Communion. Yeah. I think that's the one that really stands out for me. I wanted to, when I was a little girl, they used to bake a little communion cookies or biscuits in the kitchen of my church. Mm -hmm. And they were the best tasting things I ever <laughs> put in my back. That wasn't allowed to happen until I was dead communion. Yeah. I mean, dead confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. So I would go up after church and beg for them. Um, <laughs> And that was the, the smell, the, the, the taste of them were just the most, I still, and I've never been able to replicate those little biscuits. <laughs> well, since you're being honest about that, through the years in different churches, you can tell when the bread's good, when the bread's oh, yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who bought this loaf? <laughs> I mean, sorry, Jesus, but, you know, it's not. Very, very degree. Versus the, the goodness goodness of taste. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking about where do we observe God's goodness in worship, and sometimes it's, <laughs> it's more present. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, I think yes, sir. she chose when she used tea as an indicator. I think there's an alcohol that that was caused. No, in Afghanistan in particular, we read a book called Two Cups. A lot of people read it. It's pretty good. And uh, that's one of the things. This is hospitality. And when you sit down to a cup of tea, uh, they use two cups because if they like that, that would take their step. Okay. And then you'll notice in some of the TV shows, uh, they did something with his education, if you watch that, they always put the kettle on. Mm -hmm. That's how long they sit there. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and I knew a couple that, that whenever they were arguing or fighting, they would put the kettle on and have a cup of tea because of the time that it takes for tea to brew. You know, the, all that, they would not engage in their fight, so to speak, their argument or their conversation. They wouldn't hash stuff out until the tea, because it allowed for that time and that space, and then they would, you know. <laughs> it is. It is. Yep. The other thing about tea, you can use a brewed tea. The way you make it makes a difference in what it tastes like. Sure. That's, that's really interesting. I was uh, in Turkey and I was buying tiles to go in our home, yeah. and the, they just the family came out and said, "No, you have to sit down and have tea for mm -hmm. And the whole conversation about bargaining was done over the, the tea. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a restaurant here in Tampa that serves Mediterranean food, and um, at the end, the host will come around with with Turkish cups, you know, those glass cups, mm -hmm. with, and offer people tea, even if you didn't order. But it's a it's hospitality, just what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I think she used it for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to find it. Yeah. I would think worldwide tea would be more a symbol of hospitality than coffee. I suspect it's an older drink too. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was brought up in the Episcopalian Church, and the wine had a particular taste. It was the same kind of wine every week. And all that, although that was 60 years ago, I, 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 that brings back memories. When I have a certain kind of wine, it brings back the memories of that. Uh, very, very good. Wine. Yes. And we, have, we associate those memories with our senses in powerful ways. Taste and, and smell are supposed to be some of the biggest connectors to memory. So we talk about all touching. What? Where do we encounter God's goodness in in the sense of touch in worship? Passing the peace. Yeah, passing the peace. Opening the Bible, finding the passage, the feel of your bulletin and the cover for the hymn. Laying all the things. Yeah, Mark, absolutely. Whenever we we commission 
folks, or we have elders being recognized. We have laying on a hand sometimes. Yeah. And the baptism. There's one, yeah. yeah. We not we may not get to personally do the touching, but we, that is an act of God's goodness, and that touching that happens. Um, door. Yeah, shaking, 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 shaking. Yeah. Something that struck me early on in my life was, and I made a point of it when I administered communion, you can only receive it by taking it from someone else. And then you, that, for me, still has a lot of meaning that you take the communion tray and pass it to someone else. Yeah. I think, I don't have this sense when I'm up in the pulpit, but when I been in worship in other places, the, the wooden pew that I'm sitting on is mm -hmm. significant to me. And I've heard a number of comments here about where are the cushions are. <laughs> I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't here for any of that. I, don't position me. I have no say in whether there's cushions or not. But but the feel of, of a wooden pew underneath me or being the, the kind of the rounded, smooth part of what's, you know, when you stand up, all those things to me have always stood out as, as a sense of touch, of of, especially when it's worn, because you're kind of like, I'm in a space that has been here for a long time, and many hands have pushed yeah. up on this pew to stand up. So our sense of our senses, whether we don't, you know, I think some of them are very obvious to us, and some of them maybe we have to think a little bit about, but we recognize that all five senses are at play in our worship, um, and are opportunities for us to encounter the goodness of God in our worship. Uh, one of the quotes I wanted to lift up for you all there was, Christian worship then trains us to recognize and respond to beauty. We learn to embrace the pleasures of being human and of human culture. Our God-given innate thirst for enjoyment and sensuousness is directed towards the one alone who can quench it, the God who we were made to enjoy forever. So I want to continue on this theme of encountering God in worship. Um, and have uh, have you all do a little sharing question. So again, for our folks online, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a comment from Janice. Um, she had lifted up the peppermint given to me to quiet me during church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one. Both the sense of taste and the sense of smell, of course, wonderful. Thank you, Janice. Um, so we're going to have a, a little bit of, of, of group, or of small group sharing. I will, I will break uh, do a breakout group for you all online and invite you to share and please let me know in the chat if that is not working um but um the question i'd like for you all as we continue to kind of think about where we encounter god and worship using our different senses is thinking about where you have worshiped god we've talked mainly about kind of here in the traditional connection where have you worshiped god what has been the most unusual spot that you have worshiped god okay so that's the question What's been the most unusual spot that you've worshipped God? What elements of worship were present, as you kind of think about that and share with one another? And again, we're thinking about what senses were employed. Is it anything different than what you do on a normal Sunday here? Um, and then if there's some highlights you want to lift up, we'll have an opportunity to share that. I will share mine just to kind of get you started as you think about. So probably one of the most unusual places I've worshipped was in a Perkins restaurant. <laughs> I was scheduled to be the pulpit supply from a cloud memorial Presbyterian church over in Bartow. And Hurricane Irma came through and knocked down a lot of trees. They were without power. They couldn't even access their parking lot. They couldn't get in. But they still wanted to have worship. And so they contacted me. They made arrangements. They said, would you still be willing to come and preach? We're going to meet in the back room of the Perkins restaurant. And so I said, well, of course, we got to worship. And so... The most unusual place I have ever preached, for sure, but have had worship, was in the back room of a Perkins restaurant. And a lot of those elements of worship were there, but also, I mean, we talk about the senses that might have been present. There is a strong smell of hamburgers and fries, <laughs> and whatever they had to get in the grill, picking up those pancakes when we started, and we shifted to lunch over the course of worship. And then the, the church community stayed and had, had a meal together. But... Um, so I just lift up that as an example. So where where's an unusual place that you have worshipped? And um, what elements of worship were there? And more importantly, what senses maybe that were different than what you experienced here? So pair up as you'd like. I'll get our folks online um, in, a, in a breakout group. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So my friends online, you should have received an opportunity to join a breakout. Hey, I know you're with the hospital.
about different worship experiences you have. I heard some folks talk about um, sunrise services. Uh, are there any ones that anybody wants to lift up that was particularly unusual or particularly sensible? Oh, we've we got, we got people pointing at you, so you must have a good one. That's really I was just saying, I guess the most unusual one, was, I, I won't go into all the details, about um, growing up in a small town in South Georgia, and there were two churches, the Baptist and the Methodist. Uh, my family was Methodist. And, uh, but it, it, uh, most of the community lived in the town of 2000. But there were a lot of families that lived out in the country. They were farmers. And they had their country churches. And so the, whoever was in that farming area went to that church. So I have a girlfriend that was a young teenager. Um, but she would say, uh, oh, you want to come spend a weekend at, with you know, at my house and out in the farm? And I did that weekend. And Sunday came around and she said, well, we go to church on Sunday. I said, well, I do too in town. And so we got dressed we went to church. And I thought it would just you know, be a you know, normal service. And they had the only time I've, I've been part of and witnessed and participated was they had the, what you read about the Bible, the foot washing. Mm -hmm. That Jesus had. You know, it was real back in those times that the country churches believed basically, you know, uh, literally in everything in the Bible. And so we had the foot washing. And then after that, um, they had the big picnic <clears throat> spread after the service, you know, um, with everybody participating. So, I think these guys kind of couldn't oh, go yeah. back. I mean, <laughs> how many of you would have come back the second time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if you got, if it was a big foot wash. Everybody that's a church. Only if you had a new pedicure. Right. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great reminder, though. I mean, we do occasionally we'll have that as part of our, like, a Monday, Thursday service, or we'll lift it up for our children and children's moment in that mm -hmm. service. But it is another opportunity in, in the act of worship to encounter both the sound of water maybe in a basin or the, obviously it's a touch but for the whole church family to do it yeah that's something to do <laughs> yeah. 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 very good well, thank maybe, you maybe we should all experience that next week oh, yeah. <laughs> having been on the, the giving and the receiving it it's a very powerful yeah. experience yeah, it is uh, and very humbling to have someone wash your feet in a service like that uh, that that was more uncomfortable for me than actually washing someone you know, that's just an act of service and that felt good but to have someone do that to you feels weird. It does. It's a very humbling, kind of vulnerable moment, for sure. Um, so thank you for sharing. I hope you all had some good conversation about that. So uh, we're kind of shifting a little bit from 
how we encounter God's goodness in worship. Uh, we're also talking about how we encounter God's goodness in the world around us. And she encourages us to kind of to use worship as a place where we're trained to look for, using our senses, God's goodness. But how do we do that every day? Part of what she lifts up is kind of seeking out tiny moments where we can encounter God's goodness and kind of recognizing the role of our senses in that. She also throws up a few words of caution as well um, to say that, you know, in our culture, uh, we have a very complex relationship with pleasure, with things that bring us joy and goodness. And I would agree with her that we oftentimes <coughs> experience around us an overindulgence in that. And so it's like if we enjoy something, we're going to really enjoy it. We go all in on it, right? Um, and we get carried away. And, and we have folks who are addicted to things because of that enjoyment. Um, and, we, and we get to a place where we sometimes um, have kind of inordinate love, where we kind of we, we forget that all this goodness that we enjoy in the world comes from God. We, we ignore and lose sight of the source of the goodness. And we kind of get our priorities out of whack. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about necessarily things that are bad for us, but sometimes our priorities get skewed and we, you know, we place other things that we enjoy above recognizing where they come from in terms of the source of that joy, the source of that goodness. Are you talking about my um, ultimate quest for the best coconut ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> It all could be if you skip church to go find that coconut ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <good. Yeah. laughs> so, but if, it, if it's something like that, it's a great example that consumes us or causes us to neglect other things or to recognize that that delicious coconut cream and sugar come from, you know, the one who created all those things. You know, this, this, when we get those things kind of out of, out of order, out of priorities, um, that we um, can lose sight of that. So uh, she also lifts up kind of our workaholism and our constant connectivity. Those both fight against our ability to be to be present and to really enjoy the pleasure of the moment. And um, I've got a college-age daughter who um, who struggles with a little bit with anxiety and the constantly worrying about what might happen or what's to come. And my reminder to her is one that I have to remind myself, and I even say it sometimes in our opening of worship, is to be where your feet are, to be present. And, and be, recognize the present, the moment you are in, and what she lifts up is to be present in those moments and really enjoy God's goodness around us, right? So to be where our feet are and recognize the, the pleasure of the moment. Yeah. I'm just dying to read this. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, it's, it's from Philippians 4, 8, mm -hmm. and this is just to me exactly what we're talking about, and this has been probably for the past couple of years one of the, one of the things I've read many nights. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that is kind of what, to me, what this is all about. And I feel like that, that Paul was saying, okay, if you just do this, everything else will be okay. You know, if you could just you know, find the good. And so this has been that's been one of the things that we read a lot at night. We're really good at it. It's not Thank worried. you. Absolutely. Recognize the God's goodness all around us and to think that and be grateful for it. Yeah, she lifted up a quote from C. S. Lewis in the mm -hmm. lessons about you're trying to figure out what to do to start where you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> start where you are. Yes, ma'am. I have been the, the, trying to think of a lot of different possibilities to share with what we're talking about today. And one of the things I'd like to share is sometimes less is more. Uh, I am, for several years now, I've been following the plan put out by Our Daily Bread mm -hmm. to read through the Bible through, through the year. And I noticed that I wanted to be quiet while I'm reading. So I don't turn on the television. Now, in most homes that I know, the TV or the radio goes on immediately when they get out of bed, and it stays on nearly all day. And and I, I have found there's a sweetness and a quietness. And, and I, I can really put my mind for what I'm reading, 
if I don't have that next fraction hanging in the air around me. And there are some people that can't stand quiet. And I'm sorry about that because they need to, they need to just train themselves a little bit. We can train ourselves to do whatever we think we need to do. But we have to remember that we have to think we need to do it. Because what you think you know, that, that script you use there. All of us think on those things. And then, if that's what you're thinking, that's what's going to come out of your mouth, and that's that's what's going to feed your spirit. So, I recommend a little bit of quiet. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to sit around and quiet all the time, but a little bit of quiet gives you time to really think. And, and um, just feel the presence of no matter where you are, you have to feel that he's with you and uh, and he cares about you. He's not watching over you. That is true. And just have a little quiet just in your spirit to appreciate. I think there's something to that quiet that as we think about our using our senses to recognize God's goodness around us. And sometimes quiet is necessary to kind of be attuned to those senses and be attuned to where God's goodness is at work in us. Think about this. Only slightly over a hundred years ago was there radio. The computer, the TV, the phone, and the cell phone, all has happened in less than a hundred years. So, what was there to distract someone in 1850, or prior to that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was something, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we had so much to com in our world lot, today, <coughs> competing for our quietness, for our attention. It was a newspaper. Okay. Yeah, that was it. The newspaper. newspaper. Yeah. Um, so I'm mindful of our time. So I want to wrap up a few quick thoughts. Um, so getting at this, she, she's talking about the importance of these, speaking these tiny moments. So as you lift it up, it's a tiny moment of quiet, of reflection, or a sharing and reading of scripture in the evening. But speaking these tiny moments of beauty in our day to help train us <coughs> in the way of adoration and discernment so that we can take notice of where God is at work in our lives. Um, and, and the quote that I wanted to lift up there is, she says, you know, it takes strength to enjoy the world. We must exercise a kind of muscle to revel and delight. If we neglect exercising that muscle, if we never savor a lazy afternoon, if we must always be cleaning out the fridge or volunteering at church or clocking in more hours, we'll forget how to notice beauty and we'll miss the unmistakable reality of goodness that pleasure trains us to see. She's talking about noticing and savoring and reveling in the goodness of God. So it's important for us to be mindful of that. And then she throws in this quote at another place that I just love from Annie Diller that says, Creation need not play to an empty house. Being mindful of just the goodness of God's creation around us, right? The question I was going to have you share, we're out of time, but I want you to kind of think about it. Um, what brings you joy in your life? Where do you find goodness, God's goodness? What brings you joy? And you can't say family. Because my experience is if I were to ask this group, share out loud one thing that brings you joy. 90% of you are going to say the word family. And that's lovely. But what else brings you joy in your life? That's a gift. Let's say family is a gift. Okay. What else brings you joy in your life? What gets in the way of your experience of joy or pleasure of God's goodness? So think about those two questions as you leave. What brings you joy? What gets in the way of you experiencing God's goodness? Your homework as we look ahead to the coming week or your, um, for your consideration. Um, reflect on how you've seen God's character through pleasure and delight and beauty and artistry. Take notice of where God is at work and the joy of your day. You've heard lots of examples of ways that you might do that. So looking for those tiny moments. And if you're a note taker or a journaler, be writing those down, reflecting on those. Setting aside intentional time this week to do something you find lovely, pleasurable, delightful. Enjoying some coconut ice cream. <laughs> Whatever it might be, right? Or some quiet. Notice your senses in church. So we've done this exercise together, but I want us to pay attention to that. 
What do you see, smell, taste, hear, and feel? And how does that shape your worship experience? Maybe it's the peppermint, right? And then lastly, taste, smell, or look at something pleasing and beautiful and consider how it shapes you. So those are for your consideration in the week ahead. Like I said, we have one week left. We'll be talking about sleeping, finding God in the ordinary act of going to sleep, of concluding our day. And so let's close our time in a word of prayer. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, is there anybody here who still has a sewing machine who is a seamstress that would like to work on a small project that I think they would feel uh, gratified to do? How about this? I'm going to close in prayer, and if that, and you can pray about that. <laughs> if you are someone who has a sewing machine and has an interest in doing that, please come see Robert right after the prayer. Thank you. Yeah. Let's pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks for uh, this time together. We thank you for the gift of things that are beautiful in our wor world. We're grateful for our five senses and the ability to encounter our world and your goodness in lots of different ways. Lord, help us to be grateful for that. Help us to take time in our day this week ahead that we might notice uh, your goodness, to notice where you're present, and to be grateful for that. Lord, be with us uh, throughout this day, and in your name we pray. Amen. So if you are a seamstress and want to help us out, come see Robert, please. Thank you, Thank you.